Two years ago, I 3D printed, painted, and assembled an Iron Man Mark III helmet. And now, I'm bored of it. So, I found a 3D model and some instructions on a site called Fangs this past fall of a much more interesting build. I'm Shane, and this is my build of the Iron Man Mark V helmet. This version of the helmet was worn in Iron Man 2 as a part of the Formula 1 scene where Tony deploys a suit of his that was folded up inside of a suitcase. I wonder if I could get that through TSA. I have pre-checked, so it should be fine. In order to make the helmet more compact, the base plate is broken up into nine motorized pieces, all of which open sequentially. Because of the complexity and sheer awesomeness of this helmet, it's been a hit on the replica market and a realistic crop sales all over the internet. I would never buy one for myself because one, they are crazy expensive and the cheap ones would probably show up looking like this. By the way, no shame at all to this kid, he's doing a great job. And two, buying one would take all the fun out of the many tedious hours of working with tiny screws, backtracking to deal with the consequences of my actions and the crippling anxiety of how much money would be down the toilet for not finishing this. Hmm. As I've mentioned, these are not my designs. I got this great set of instructions and models from a user called Box and Loop. There's already a video out that shows the whole build process, but I figured I would make my own to show not only fixes to the problems I found, but also how I took the project up a notch with the finishing process using my own tricks. For this build, a full list of materials can be found in the PDF guides that are linked in the description, but in my case, I printed most of the parts on my Ender 3 Max and used a little over a roll of filament, which would have been less if I didn't have to reprint a bunch of parts due to not being able to read the word mirrored. As well as having prints as high as Snoop Dogg on 420 with bases as weak as this country's financial state. I also used the cheapest wing servos I could find on banggood.com because the good ones take forever to arrive and are not cheap. I got a bunch of 9 gram servos, which are the most common and the cheapest type. In case you actually care, it's called a 9 gram not only because it's a rough estimate of the servo's weight without the leads on, but the name really means it has a standard size for the hole it will fit into. The actual weight is going to be different than advertised, like your mom. One of my shop velocities is if there's any chance I'm going to need this again, I will buy the bulk pack which led me to buying full kits of JST and DuPont connectors, some packs of slide and proximity switches, as well as a few sets of metric hardware because I needed an unreasonable amount of three to four millimeter bolts. And just a note, you don't really need the two millimeter bolts since they're just used to test fit the dome. This goes along with my other philosophy of if it's not something that will kill me and or maim me when it breaks, buy it dirt cheap. Thanks, China. In the beginning, I set a tight budget, but over the course of the build, I stopped keeping track entirely and bought whatever I needed just to get it done. When you hit that sunk cost line, sometimes you just gotta lean into it. After the many, many hours of printing, I took all of my parts to the dirty side of the shop and mixed up Bondo to spread on all the surfaces that would be visible. I prefer to apply Bondo before the filler primer because it not only does a better job covering initial layer lines, but it also sands so much cleaner than primer. I sand the primer as little as possible because it really likes to clog up sandpaper whether it's wet or dry. This is never my favorite part because Bondo tends to set fast, leaving very little time to work it into details. And plus, it makes my entire shop smell like my great aunt's house for some reason. Once the Bondo dries, Get ready for enough time spent sanding to give you early onset arthritis. I used a combination of an orbital sander, a detail sander, a Dremel, and a regular sandpaper from 60 to 400 grit or so. Seriously, by the time I got it looking good, my everything hurt. Once I officially could pass for a coal miner, I moved on to test assembly of the back dome. Everything seemed to fit fine, so next up was paint. I set up my collapsible paint booth with ventilation, then started on spray painting all of my pieces. I started with filler primer on all the pieces, and this caused me some unexpected problems. When the coats started cracking on some of the pieces, 
This could have been because a layer was too thick, which meant that due to paint constricting when it dries, it had so much tension across the curved surface that it cracked apart. After a few rounds of wet sanding and a couple of recoats, the parts were ready for the real paint. I assumed the painting would be the easiest part of the build, but I couldn't have been any more wrong. The next problem I found was due to my own stupidity actually. I went to use the spray paint I thought I used on my first helmet, but as it turns out, I used the color way too bright. After I went and bought the paint in the correct color, which was Rust-Oleum Burgundy Enamel, I could finally get the red parts done. For the reflective steel parts, I used the Rust-Oleum Metallic Silver Spray Paint, and I was honestly impressed at the final surface it left. As a side note, when using this paint, you shouldn't use a clear coat. A clear coat will dull the shine from the silver paint. The issues in this step happened because a part that's being made glossy and shiny should be free of any lint and contaminants to keep the imperfections from killing the illusion. I wiped down all of my parts with mineral spirits and a microfiber cloth, but after spraying the paint, the fan from the fume exhaust suddenly decided to pull in a sandstorm and coated my parts in dust. It took two or three more tries for most pieces to fix them fully. In between coats of paint, I got to work in the electronics to hopefully relieve some of that frustration. This strategy failed miserably. First, I loaded the Arduino code, which was supplied with the models, onto one of my cheap Chinese Arduino Nanos. Next, based on the electronic schematics from the documents, I soldered all the wires of correct lengths to each of their spots on the board. I could have used DuPont pins that came with the board, but I decided to just solder the wires to the through holes to save some vertical space. I used mostly 22 gauge, but anything from 26 gauge to 18 gauge should be fine. After a serious learning curve in terminating wires with JST and DuPont connectors, and many tiny cuts on my fingies later, I had all the wires terminated. As a note, when soldering JST male connectors, pre-solder the wire and minimize the amount of heat to the connector because the plastic can melt very easily. For the male USBs that plug into the battery pack, I just used the plugs for some really old and out of date chargers I had lying around the shop but I'm sure you can just snip your friends while they're not looking if you really need one. Just kidding, don't do that. Never forget to test all of the raw hardware before wasting time assembling it all. Cheap foreign hardware tends to be finicky at best and straight up broken at worst. And I happen to have been a victim of this many times. Once I had all the electronics wired on the test bench, the final step is always to check the continuity with the multimeter, then test it with power. Unsurprisingly, I ran into an issue. For some reason, the relay board wasn't distributing any signals. So I was having a problem with my driver board and I realized it's a good learning opportunity. So uh, I'm gonna teach you a little bit how this works and the reason why when I turned it on, uh, none of the servos were moving whatsoever. Now I got this board, this isn't the Adafruit, like uh, the, main, the main brand is. This is, I think, High Let Go, got it off Amazon. Uh, a little about the board is that it has the ground. The ground is connected through uh, a bus through everything. Don't worry about OE. SCL is serial clock. Uh, this is communication by I2C or I squared C. Uh, it's just a two. It's just two wires that uh, send send data serially, which means one after the other or one bit after the other, uh, in sequences. I believe it's eight bits, with the last bit being uh, whether to read or write. And then you have. Uh, that's just a clock for it then you have the data bit or uh, the data line which uh that just sends in the data telling you know which servo to turn on or which pins to turn on then you have vcc vcc is the uh, voltage supply for or voltage uh, intake for the chip so it has to be uh for the chip uh, between 3.3 and 5 volts nothing was turning on when i was working with it so i checked that turns out it was fine the chip was getting uh, 3.7 volts of power uh which is perfect uh, the V plus line, I plugged in an extension cord to the breadboard and found out it was only putting out around, uh, was it 0 0.5 volts, which is a huge problem. So I checked these terminals up here. They're still putting out, this goes to the main power supply and I was, it still put out five volts. So thought, what's wrong with that? Uh, then I was looking around and uh, V plus is also available in three other spots right here. This is a V plus line in the servos. Uh, and then these two uh, 
these two ports or pins right over here. So what I did was after a lot of trial and error, took out this wire and, uh, sh and used some clips and attached it to here from the main power supply and everything worked just fine. So careful where you're buying your, buying your boards and always check the cheaper they are, always try to check them uh, when something goes wrong as uh, check the hardware is what I mean. Because this terminal, obviously, something's broken in there to where uh, it's not, uh, it's not directly connected, or there's some sort of resistor, resist a high resistance in it. I'm not entirely sure, uh, but yes, just try to. Here, cut that. So I'm going to go ahead and solder that up, and uh, after taking it off, of course, and uh, hopefully everything works. And back to the assembly. I secured all the dome parts with super glue. When gluing glossy surfaces, consider roughing up the areas that touch for better adhesion. Honestly, I meant to, but I completely forgot and it seemed to work all right, so I'll take it. And now for the really fun part, attaching all the motors to the faceplate. I'm putting together the linkages, but this bolt uh, is pan head instead of the countersunk that's supposed to be. So I'm gonna take this over to the drill press and see what we can do. So I chucked the bolts into the drill press and filed them down to size that would fit. And of course, I ended up having to open up and countersink the holes on multiple arm pieces as well. If you build this, please actually read the instructions they give and only place the plastic wings on the servos after you've zeroed them with the Arduino. There was a problem I ran into with the wing servo that led to me needing to teach myself how servos and Arduino uh, libraries worked in one night. This problem came when I went to close a mask and one of the top pieces kept clicking and spiking the current while never reaching the point where it could turn off. I realized the problem was that there wasn't enough freedom on angle placement for the plastic wing and the mask limit was stopping the motor from ever being able to reach an end point. The servo that couldn't find home was real close to getting picked up by Dyfus. Orphan jokes are funny, it's just that the punchline is never apparent. The way I fixed the bug was by changing the Arduino code to offset the range of the affected motor by the right amount of milliseconds to make sure its endpoint is within the physical range of the arm. The rest of the mask assembly was so painful and full of backtracking, refitting parts, and waiting for more hardware to arrive that I didn't have the heart to, rehear to record the entire process. Honestly, if I had a choice of either doing that all over again or licking the Grinch's big toe, I'd happily pick the stray green hairs out of my mouth afterwards. I really should have cut down the eye LED panels to match the sockets, but everything seemed to move fine without it, so I didn't bother. Well, that, and I also completely forgot and it was way too late once I remembered. Almost done. All that's left is the wire management, which seemed easier, but still had me disassembling half the mask just to fit some wires under where they needed to go. The only problem in this step was that when I plugged in all of the motors to test, one of the motors wasn't working, but with a quick slip swap of jumper wires, that solved the problem fairly easily. Also, this is the time to play around with the required voltage because although the technical requirement said five volts, the voltage range that the motors liked most under load happened to be around seven, six to seven volts. Finally, the
the litany of issues has been tamed. And although I haven't hooked up a battery pack simply because I don't have one that will fit into the designated spot, it looks awesome. And the satisfaction of that first flawless open and close is unexplainable. Regardless of how much I complain about the stupid roadblocks that came up, this helmet coming to life would have brought a tear to my eye if it didn't kill me in the inside first. Hopefully anyone who's planning on making this can learn from and avoid the mistakes that I made. Uh, although this is technically wearable, I will not be attempting that. One, because the pins in the driver board stick straight out, not at a 90 degree bend, so I may damage some jumpers. And two, because I'm really not trying to get my hair caught in motors today. Also, if you think I know where I'm gonna put it, I'd say you have way too much faith in me. It's been on a shelf in my shop for the past six months and counting. Uh, let me know in the comments what room you believe it belongs in. I'm thinking the bathroom would be perfect. I feel at midnight and don't turn the light on, those glowing eyes will certainly help your process along. Thanks for watching. Remember to let me know if you liked it. I'll see you next time. One, because the pin, this is so slow.